we're good to go. All right, cool. Well, welcome everybody. This is Manipulators Part 2. I'll be explaining a little bit about why uh, we do it in three parts. Um, but right now you should see the Jumpstart logo. Um, just a little bit about me. I'm the head coach of Team 3023 Stark Industries. Um, my first year was uh, Breakaway 2010. I'll show you that in a minute here. Oh yeah, there we go. 2010 Breakaway. Um, I did not pick Stark Industries as our team name. I was lucky enough to inherit that. Uh, I love it though because Tony Stark's superpower is just that he knows robotics and that is just so cool and wonderful. And actually this is, if you can see behind me, this is our team's uh, workroom where we have completely replicated the, I, I'm just kidding, it's a virtual background, I'm just messing with you. So um, why do we do this in three parts? Well, uh, we, tried it, we tried it one, I think Yurik made me do it the first year in one, and I was motor mouthing my whole way through it, then we did two, and finally three seems to be the winner here. Um, this one we're talking about arms and elevators, and just to give us some context here, this year's going to be very different. Let's be honest, 2020 is a dumpster fire. But, but uh, two weeks ago, Dean talked about how I, I just, I was, <laughs> I was inspired and impressed by his optimism because he's like, I look around in 2020 and I just see opportunities to solve problems and innovate. And I'm like, dang, dude, that's amazing. Uh, my closest I could get to that is this, 2020 is a dumpster fire. We make it work. How do we make the best of the situation? Well, it is a fire, so this is what my team has been saying. We're going to try to make s'mores over the dumpster fire. Now, this year is very different, but let's be honest, that's always true. They always throw a different challenge at us. We always have to, you know, think outside the box and change around. So this year is going to be really different. And what I want you guys to think about as you watch through this uh, presentation, most of us are going to be trying to design a game. and. I want you to think about all the different past games that have happened and how that can influence you um, to consider your game design. Also, this is an amazing year to prototype. Um, maybe in past years, you've decided not to build a shooter because it was just more than your team was capable of. Well, this is a great year to, to do that. Build a shooter, build a hangar, build things you've never built before. It's fine, go for it, you got the time. Also, we're gonna use this as a big training year. So. That being said, um, we're going to run through real quick here. Every game piece that first has ever had in 1992, we had tennis balls, 93. We had, these were the 13 inch ones. These are very similar to the ones we had for deep space. Um, there was a water filled ball at one point, which, so there was a water challenge. Uh, 94 was soccer ball. We had a large exercise ball, exercise ball again. This is one of the few times you saw the same game piece back to back. Uh, then inner tubes in 97, 98, exercise ball again, 99 was the floppies. This was a huge flop. Uh, teams hated it. It was notorious. Um, if you talk to Andy Mark, he's got a rant about this. I think he was on a team that year as a, as a high schooler or something like that. But um, they're basically like inner tubes. It's, it's like if, if the inner tube from, if this type of like floaty inner tube and a giant uh, bean bag had a baby. That's what you're looking at. And now try to, it was like filled with sand or something like that. And trying to pick these up was apparently just like the worst thing a robot's ever been asked to do. Uh, cooperation entered the lexicon of first robotics in the year 2000. Diabolical dynamic, that was like two games in one. Zeal, stack attack. For those of you who were here for recycle rush, that was not the first time uh, totes were used in a first robotics game. 2004, Frenzy. 2005, I kind of want to, I love this one. I don't know why. These tetrahedrals are huge. They're 30 inch and they were like heavy and robots fell over a lot. And we're gonna be talking about that a little bit in this session. Aim High, it's a big shooting game. One of the first ones that was really a big shooting game. Um, inner Tubes, Overdrive, Exercise Ball again, Lunacy. Lunacy was weird, those were weird. Um, that was my team's rookie year, but I was not yet the coach. Breakaway, my first year. Logomotion, David's first year. Rebound Rumble, that was a fun game. Basketball, Frisbees, everybody loved. So there was a good run. And then 2015, if we have game designers who are watching, um, 2015 was not the proudest moment in first game design. And uh, 
But the, the cool thing was, this was really a turning point. 2016, they totally made up for it with the game design. This was like revolutionary, it blew everybody's minds. 2017, arguably, it's my favorite game. It's a lot of people's favorite game. That was good stuff. But we had the gear and the fuel and then a box. <laughs> it was like, hey, here's a box. Um, 2019, Deep Space, now we're getting into times. These are ones that a lot of teams remember more um, than last year we had the 10 inch squishy. Now, here's the question. So which specific game piece had the most appearances? Uh, for you guys to play along here, at the top of your screen, you should see a little annotate button. And in that menu for the drop down, you're gonna see uh, stamps. So what we're gonna do here is this, we're going to annotate, I'm gonna put images up here and put a green check mark next to the one that you think had the most appearances. So I'm gonna give you a little time to find the annotate button. Hopefully that works for you. And then find the stamp. Okay, cool. Somebody, it's a good call. Somebody's got the exercise ball. Somebody else, the bigger one. Okay, oh, okay. Everybody's just following suit now. Copy here. Ooh, squishy, good one. Somebody got a star. What I love about robotics is a green check mark. You're like, I want a star. I'm gonna put a star, and that's cool. I get that. A lot of good ones. Okay, most of you are pretty on point. So, oh wow, okay, we're going all out. All right, I'm gonna let a few other people in here. Oh, check marks at the bottom. That might have been me. I don't know. All right, so let's see who's right. Hopefully you were right. Let me do, I think if I do annotate, and, uh, I'm gonna clear the screen. There we go, sweet, okay. Good, that worked better than I thought it would. All right, so which ones reoccurred? There was a tie. So if, if you said either the 13 diameter squishy ball like we had um, as part of the uh, fuel for the shuttle, um, you were right, and if you said the 24-inch diameter exercise ball, you were also right. Both these tie for five times. Now, the squishy, squishy foam ball, four times. If you include, there was once it was a 7-inch, three times, 10-inch ball. This one, three times, three times, um, and the toe disappeared twice, and the 30-inch diameter exercise ball. Now, some people say, hey, if you include the 30-inch diameter and the 24-inch diameter as one game piece, which, okay, I get the logic behind that, you have a whopping seven appearances, which is kind of insane. Now, for the outliers, um, the tennis ball, I kind of want the tennis balls to come back just because I think that'd be fun to launch tennis balls out of like a giant shooter thing. Uh, Frisbees, Steamworks, and the hatch. Now, last year when I made this presentation, everybody's like, oh, look, 17, 18, 19. There's a there's a pattern. No, there's not. If you ever try to find a pattern in the game design or the game pieces, just it's a great way to lose your mind. It's not going to work because as soon as there's a pattern, they break the pattern, which is what they did in 2020. We had the uh, 13 inch rubber, like, you know, dodgeball ball, which has been in like four games now. So don't, uh, you'll lose your mind trying to do patterns. Now, this is about manipulators, not game pieces. So now you know the game piece. And that is, that is a really important question, um, but this is, this is tied for the most important question because uh, what you have to do is now, now you know what to manipulate, now you need to know what you're gonna do with it. Most games have a pretty relatively straightforward process. You gotta bring it in, hold it, transfer it somewhere in the bot, and then score. Now, intake is what we talked about in part one of the manipulators, which you'll be able to find that PowerPoint in this video up there. This one's gonna be a lot more about transfer and hold at part two, which is, arms, elevators, and lifts. So first we're gonna look at arms, arms and elevators. So uh, arms, some general advice for arms, no matter what arm you're building, you gotta do it lightweight, tubes, thin walls. Uh, it's, it's dicey though with everything in robotics, you need to make it light, but also strong. You need to have sensors and controls and limit switches, otherwise you're gonna break something. This is a pretty insane Lego arm in this picture down here. Um, linkages help control the arm. This is something we always kiss, keep it seriously simple. The, better, the, the fewer parts to build, the fewer parts that break, it's simplicity always, but then that doesn't, there's always that balance between simplicity and doing what you want. 
if you can use off the shelf items or manufacture stuff, counterbalance. Um, the motor can be a great counterweight. There was a team once that used the battery as their counterweight, which is probably not optimal um, because considering the one that I know of, the battery fell out of the robot while they were uh, flying through the air. And the robot went a lot farther than we all thought it would after the battery fell out. So that was, that was interesting to find out. But I would say this, um, what I've noticed is a lot of teams don't necessarily take advantage of mechanical advantage. Um, there aren't as many springs or bungees as you could. We tend to just be like, well, how much uh, power do we need for the motor? And then we put a motor in that can do that. That's a great way to blow out your motor. It's also a great way to um, overtax your electrical system if you do an electrical audit, which you should. A spring can go a long way to help. So what kind of arms are we talking about here? Well, there's fixed arms, uh, jointed arms, and parallel arms. We're going to talk about all three. First, we're going to do fixed arms. Now this, I'm doing a little bit of a preview of part three here. In rebound rumble, so part three, I'm going to talk a lot more about the field elements. And this is one that uh, you should always watch the field element videos, the field guides. Because in um, rebound rumble, people didn't necessarily realize that these, these balance beams were extremely uh, powerful. You had, to, you had to be able to put two batteries on the balance beam 28 inches away from the center, and it should still stay level because they had massive springs. So teams didn't necessarily watch that, know that. They, they just had a you know, four by eight sheet of plywood, and they'd boom and drive up. And when they got to competition, their arm was not powerful enough. And so the thing you always have to make sure is how much, uh, how much power do you need? What does your arm need to do? Now, that being said, if you're building a fixed arm, we don't often necessarily calculate in what's going down here. A lot of kids, they haven't had physics on the team and you have to help them realize that uh, you need to calculate the force needed, including the weight of the arm and including the game piece, which usually we forget one of those two. Realize that distance matters and distance changes things, distance changes the torque. I've seen a lot of kids, they, they calculate the force needed at the motor, which is great, but you have a 12 inch arm. Well, that dramatically changes the force output at the end. And it's kind of basic, but I just wanted to make sure to get these general basics. Um, and that's pretty much it for fixed arms. Got to keep rolling here, jointed arms. Jointed arms often have three points of rotation. They work just like a human arm. There's a really great video on YouTube with the guy from uh, Grant Imahara from uh, Mythbusters, where he talks about a team that did this. So you end up having, there's a lot of weight, there's a lot of forces on these points, there's a lot of motors in here. Um, there's a website that will help you do the calculations for the arms, it's at the end of this PowerPoint, and it just really helps you realize that the linkages, the, there's just a lot going on there. And this, if you have to, sweet, it's good, but it is more complicated. My advice, the rule of thumb, most teams, my team, we figure out how much weight and then we double it. We make sure that the motors can handle twice the force that's needed. All right, so parallel arms. I like parallel arms a lot, um, but when you're building a parallel arm, the things to watch out for is there's a large amount of force on the pins and there's a lot of buckling in the lower levels. You gotta be careful for that. This one's piston operated. There were a lot of teams. This worked out really well for a lot of teams. You can tell with the yellow box here, this is from power up. And the reason why this is nice is because it keeps the game piece in the same orientation as it goes up. You don't have to have a pivot with um, some sort of wrist thing. Cause if you pick it up like this and then you go, you know, like, so it, it, it can provide some nice, nice things there. So, um, Keeps game piece, relatively simple design to build. Um, yeah, I like it. Cons, there is limited rotation. It also usually is huge and creates some issues. There's also tipping problems uh, with weight of the... So, which is better? Parallel arm? Oh wait, what's better? Sorry, that's coming in a sec. What's better than a parallel arm? Two parallel arms. I love this thing. This is sweet. Uh, here's what it looks like when it's full extended. This is a solution a team came up with for power up because, uh, yeah, it was just insanely hard to get in one parallel arm. This, this is glorious. This is beautiful. I love this thing. Um, you can tell they made it quite lightweight. There's some springs involved to help with the mechanical advantage. Um, but yeah, I love this. I love this. Now, if you're not exactly sure how parallel arm works, this is just a little GIF file. It's, it's pretty simplistic. I mean, as far as things go, um, 
It's nice. I love them. Now, lifts. So, lifts are huge. We're going to be talking about um, extension lifts. That's motion is achieved by those are levels. And then scissor lift. We will talk about scissor lifts. There's a joke on my team. We, we don't use scissor lifts, but there are teams in our our hub that have gone to state and gone to worlds with a scissor lift. So what the heck do I know? But um, I will tell you this comes from Andy Mark. So extension lifts guidelines, drive cable goes up and down. Now this is something um, I've watched. This is scary. You need to make sure you have at least 20% overlap. Now that that's problematic because teams are like, oh, we need to go this high. So half that, no, you can't do half. You got to have 20% or otherwise the thing will fall over. It's really dangerous uh, when you do something like that. Make it strong and light, and I know that is contradictory, but, uh, and there's a reason why I put this in here twice. 20% is the minimum, not the maximum. Uh, don't, don't, try to, don't try to skimp on that. You really need 20%. Uh, so extension lift considerations. This is a double stage. Um, power versus speed. Do not underestimate the power needs. Um, that is something people almost always forget in every situation. Calculate the calculations. Don't forget the game piece, which I've said before. You should have brakes, ratchets. Don't rely on the motor. This is true anytime. Just don't rely on the motor to calculate, or sorry, the motor to hold the weight of the game piece, the weight of your lift, anything like that. It's not a good idea. All right, now, building a lift. This gets complicated. So we have a lot of things going on here. Extension rigging. So you, for the rigging, we have a couple options. There's continuous and cascade and simplified cascade. Me, I love the simplified and make it as simple as possible. For contiguous, uh, we got external and internal. And this is what we're talking about when you have um, the rigging. So this is continuous rigging. And if this makes you want to cry, I get it. I'm with you. Uh, yeah. OK. And then cascade. Cascade is it's simpler in a lot of ways. So here's what's going down. Continuous rigging, you have a situation. The nice thing about this is the same speed and up. And this is, you have to have a motor driving it up and down. You can't rely on gravity ever for anything, really. It will let you down. I know gravity is always there, but it's not in robotics. That's not a, that's not a given. It's weird, I know. There's so much tension. There's so much jamming. It's just, I, I find it scary. Um, and the cabling is really complicated. So here's a visual of this. When the first stage goes up, it clicks and it hits. And then the first stage stops moving. The second stage goes up. There's just a lot of forces. There's a lot of binding. Um, and if that made you cry, this has got to be even more scary for you. This makes me, this makes me crawl in the field position and just want to rock back and forth. That's good night. This is built by high schoolers. What are you trying to do? That being said, some teams are successful with it. So it is an option, but it's even more complicated. And um, wow, yeah, it does protect the cables, though. That is the reason why people will go with this sort of a, a rigging. Now, um, a cascade rigging in two stages, you have a situation where there's uh, the up and down cables need to be on different speeds. So that is a bit problematic if you're driving it with one motor. You're going to want to figure out a way to have two sizes of drums. So there is that complexity. But what I like about this, um, there's much, much more force on the lower stage cable because what's happening, I'll show you an image where this uh, animates in just a moment. But essentially what happens is you have a traveler, which is the third stage that slides up and down on the stage two, which slides up and down on stage one, which slides up and down on the base. You got to have a lot lower gearing to deal. There's just so much high forces going on. So this one, there's a traveler inside that stage one. And they did a pretty good job with that. Um, so this one is even more simplified. That's, yeah, OK. So this is, this personally is what my team's gone with uh, several times, just because simpler is easier. You have a traveler that goes up and down inside of a single stage. And that single stage goes up and down inside of a base. You can usually, um, you just control the base, like the the cable that is connected to the, the traveler, that is just you know static on top of the, the base. And then you just control the bottom of the base, essentially, or sorry, you control the bottom of stage one. Now, 
this is where um, usually there's a lot of questions at this point. I'm just going to pause for a sec and see. Does anybody have questions pop up in the chat? Megan, if you could moderate that for me, that'd be awesome. Sure thing. This is, yeah. Usually when I'm presenting, somebody's like, wait, what? How's that work? But if, if everybody's cool, I'll keep, I'll keep trucking along here. I know we're short on time. But, and at the end, if you want to come back to any of these, I'm more than happy to do it. So this is what we like. This is what we do. Um, I will say this too, at the end of the PowerPoint, I'll show you how I stole these images from a PowerPoint from Andy Baker, who stole it from uh, Dave Whitfield. And like, it was just crazy. When I was creating this PowerPoint years ago, I just find these, these slides going back in time. It was like layers of sediment um, of first robotics. So which is better, arm or elevator? I want you to do what we did before, click on your annotate button and vote. You can vote with a star or if you want to do the check mark again or a heart if you want. Um, I'm trying to figure out where I want to. Yeah, all right. So please vote, put a heart or a star on whichever one you prefer, elevator or arm. Oh, yeah, wow. Nice. If anyone from team 217 feel like you got to represent. What year is that from? Anybody want to take a guess on 217's robot? Wait. Is that curve like a coat handler. Yeah, yeah, I'd agree. All right. So I would argue whenever uh, in first robotics and everybody says this or this, which do you choose? It's, it's almost always a trick question because the answer is always like, well, it depends on the game. It depends on the team. It depends on, you know, 50 million things. Um, and I would say, let me clear this quick here. I would say, why choose when you can have both? Uh, this is a design where basically you put an arm on your lift and this gives you a massive amount of um, flexibility. We did this one year after we saw it at a competition. We, uh, we, we just built it because we wanted to figure out how to do it. This is a combo one. This is from Cheesy Poofs 254. They did a beautiful job with this. They had an arm on their elevator and it, it worked real slick, real nice. In fact, yeah, this was a two stage. So, okay, scissor list. I'll say this. So this website, so these are some of the PowerPoints that I stole from Andy Baker. I do love this robot. I, this was like a long time ago. There aren't even bumpers. I'm thinking this is probably 2008, six, something like that, long time ago. But I love these giant wheels. I've been trying to convince my team to make giant wheels, but still, okay, advantages. Um, it's really small gets you under small things, that's nice. Disadvantages. Now, uh, tends to be heavy to be stable, doesn't deal well with side loads, it'll fall over. Uh, it's gotta be built perfectly, otherwise this thing will not work. Uh, the higher it gets, the less stable. The forces, when you first start pulling on your scissor lift, the forces are insane. I mean, like when you do the calculations on this, it is just mind blowing the amount of force that you have to have at that initial speed to get it up. Cause you're basically, you're pulling straight horizontally to try to get vertical and it's wow. So um, I do not recommend this Andy Baker. I'm totally gonna throw him under the bus that those are his words, he signed off on that. So I'm gonna use him. That's not me saying it. You take that to Andy if you disagree. Uh, so, okay, summary of all this. Look around, see what works see what doesn't work. The biggest thing is this, you got to know your design objectives and your game strategy. Something that my team struggles with, I think every team struggles with is when we get the game, our first, we're like, okay, great. We could build this, we could build that. I'm like, good, yay, not now. We first got to decide the strategy and the strategy has to determine the manipulator that you build. You've got to be careful with that. A lot of teams, we tend to build what we know Look, if, if you've built a shooter and you know how to shoot, sweet, go for it. 
but that might not be the best choice. You got to really run through the pros and cons of all the manipulators that are out there. One of the first things that my team has to do is we run through my PowerPoint really fast because they've all seen it way too many times, but we run through and be like, okay, are we doing this or this, this or this, this or this? Why? And the answer always has to be because it fits our strategy. Um, stay within your capabilities. That's another problem. It's if your team can't build, like my team can't build a scissor lift, not precisely enough, to be honest. So we're not going to do that. Um, understand your dimensions. Everybody says this, use CAD. Uh, if you can, sweet, please do do it as much as you can. My team has finally gotten to the place where we have enough kids trained up that can work that really nice. Um, make it well. I remember there was one year we built um, a mechanism and another team came over and their mechanism was very, very similar, but it was working much better. And it was, it was a beautiful mechanism. But the mentor came over and he's like, I really like your design. I think it's way better than ours. And I'm like, yeah, but yours works. He's like, oh yeah, you didn't build it well, but, um, but, I, but it was a good idea. <laughs> to which um, me and the kids were like, thank you, I think. Yeah, I'm gonna go with thank you. Um, that, was, that was a perfect example of, we had a great idea, we did not execute, we did not build it well. So the other thing is this, uh, and this, my kids get upset with me. Uh, I have one kid, I have one kid. He was like, uh, redesign was, uh, his nickname for me because it was, it was the year of Logomotion. We had these mini bots and, um, we redesigned the mini bot like five times and the kids were about ready to throw me out the door because, uh, it wasn't working. So we had to do the redesign. Then finally, I'll say this, have some fun. Put some googly eyes on it. If, um, if I don't remember when Corey Applegate is presenting, but he borrowed uh, Jarvis, our robot, uh, for because Jarvis had an elevator on it, and he's doing a demo with Motion Magic, and he needed an elevator, and theirs didn't have one, and we did, so we lent him our robot. And you'll see Jarvis has two giant googly eyes, and we also got we put a mouth on Jarvis. This is supposed to be fun for the kids. Let's not stress it out. I mean, my team, they remember goofing off, cracking jokes, um, eating pizza, drinking Mountain Dew, and you know, our, our robot's Jarvis. Every year is named Jarvis. We talk about Jarvis like he's a member of the team. Um, we discuss him when we lent him out to Corey Applegate. He's like, can he be tilted on the side? And I'm like, yes, but you need to put a pillow under his head because we, it's just, Try to keep it fun. All right. Um, this is where I have to explain that much of this PowerPoint was taken from Bruce Whitfield, who took it from Andy Mark, who took it from Greg Needle. And for all I know, these slides, like those, those ones with the other, those go all the way back to Dean Kamen. Um, these are some links about the robot arm, behind the design, cheesy poofs, 358. 358, if you don't know, they have, uh, they have an electrical Bible is what they call it. It's just, they have some really sweet materials for newer teams, or honestly, we just use it for newer members. Now, I went through that really fast. I wanna open it up for um, questions. And let me see here, I can, there is no exit strategy. Okay, so Mark Lawrence posted that quite a while ago. Cor okay, yeah, Corey's presenting at 11.30 in this breakout room. Okay, cool, thank you, Megan, I appreciate that. Um, so we, we have a bit of time for questions. There's usually a lot of questions at this point. Please type them into the chat or just unmute your mic and pop in and talk it through. I'll slide, I'll go back to the slide for whatever it goes with. I am curious though. Uh, Mark, what did you mean by there is no exit? Oh, oh, I know. When we were talking about being coaches, yeah. I'm pretty sure death is the exit strategy. But I'm not even sure they allow you to retire from robotics even when you die. I haven't looked into that yet. Yeah, Mark, you know, there really is no exit strategy. You know, know. When, <laughs> once you get hooked on this uh, program, you're there forever. I know. Yeah, somebody was asking me, they're like, well, when you retire from teaching, Will you will you stop coaching? And I'm like, why would I? Right. Then I'm, <laughs> yeah. 
for lists, should you always use chain? Okay, wow, good question. Ooh, okay, well, as, as is always the answer, uh, it depends. Um, and there are options. So lifts, okay, lifts and chain, yeah, oof. I would say this, when we're building, I'm trying to get to the one, this one here. When we're building um, a, simple, a simple cascade rigging, we usually will use a chain because, I mean, this, what you see here on screen is kind of um, overly, compli overly complicated. We essentially like, like the robot, you'll see our robot from this year in Corey's presentation. We have a chain um, just running contiguous and there's a gear up top and then there's a gear down bottom with the motor connected to it. So chains are really good for that. Um, I would say this though, we, we almost never use a chain for the traveler. That being said, you probably look at one robot from a previous year and there's chains on it. We like to use um, strap if we can, just because it's light, uh, it doesn't tend to bind. The issue, so some teams with, with the more complicated rigging, like these riggings, um, chain can be useful. Uh, cabling can cause problems because the, the metal cable will tend to bind. And when it spools on the drum, and that can cause some binding issues. We've had a lot of luck with one inch you know, ratchet strap strap. That's been extremely successful for us because it's well, two things. If you're if you're going to be spooling up, it's very thin. Uh, that's another thing that like teams don't necessarily contemplate. When you have to remember that as you spool up strap, the diameter increases, which changes the forces and it changes the uh, the distance, how much strap is accumulated on the drum as it gets thicker, and this can cause some binding issues. Uh, gear to, to, here, Mark, one yeah. one comment there. Um, some one thing I've seen some teams do when they're using stuff besides webbing or strap is they might their spool might be a, a custom 3D printed piece yes. that guides the rope yes. so that it doesn't uh, double up or wrap around itself. It it basically wraps along the length of the with the grooves spool. in it. Yeah. 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 We use we almost always uh, 3D print our our spool just to get the right diameter. Um, but yeah, that's a good idea. If you're going to use metal cable, then 3D print with grooves so that it can, you know, guide it in. Uh, Eric Schaefer, can you talk about gearing? Yes. More specifically, in what sense? Where's Eric at? Still here? While we're waiting, Mark, too, I think there was another question about the slides, if they'll be available. Oh, oh okay. Yeah, thank you. I didn't see that one. Uh, will these, oh, will these slides be posted somewhere? Yes, the whole presentation will be posted on um, Jumpstart's website and as well as the slides. All my PowerPoint um, slides will be posted there. They're also available on my team's website, which is at the bottom of the slide, but we're going to put that up on Jumpstart's website. Good question. Uh, advantages to reduce power needed by motors. Okay, yeah. Um, the question is, so whenever we're doing calculations like this, as I said before, we calculate the amount of force needed for, you got to really ask yourself the weight of the elevator, the weight of the parts. And to be honest, it's really hard to calculate in friction, because you have no idea how, uh, how much friction is going on with with your setup. One of the things we'll do, and this is this is a little bit hard, but like, uh, that's why prototyping is so important. So we'll get it set up and then you you need a force sensor of some sort. If you don't have a force sensor, a pulley and some weights will do the trick as well. So set it up, figure it out. Like if you have a setup like this, um, calculate it out, hang something here, find enough weights so that it lifts it up. That will tell you how much force is needed to lift it. Once you have that, then the question is what motor to use what power, and I talk about motors and gearing uh, a lot in the third presentation, we discussed that a lot. Something that I don't think I said here, maybe I went by really quickly, I said that you should have a ratchet or a brake of some sort so that the motor's not holding it. That is a really good idea. Um, something to think about with gearing. It's always so complicated. 
our first question is we have a we have a motor spreadsheet with our motor calculations that we um, use every year and the first question is power which we talked about a lot in the second one um power is okay so there's a bunch of slides in the third one that are awesome because like when you say power to a first robotics team you're like they're like what does that mean and the kids are like faster bigger more and they don't really articulate like power is actually it's both it's the force and the speed okay so like power is the amount of energy divided by time which is really force like work over time so force times distance over time so it's force times distance over time so it's force times speed and that's the problem we we have this balance where you often need an elevator to be fast and you often need it to be powerful. And so there's this dynamic. It cannot be both fast and have a lot of force at the same time. I mean, you, you use the biggest motor you have, no matter what, the motors have a power rating. If you don't, we have tagged up on our wall. Uh, it's a poster that VEX produces for us and it tells you the power of every motor. And if you don't have a motor spreadsheet with power calculators, all that stuff is really necessary. The other thing that we don't often think about when you gear down a motor and we are, if you're talking elevator, we're probably going to use, we do all the motor calculations and then we end up going with a uh, 775 Pro, no matter, <laughs> like it's always like we go through all these calculations and then we always use the 775 Pro. Uh, and we're going to connect that to a uh, VEX Versa Planetary Gearbox to give us the right reduction that we need. Something that we don't always calculate or think about is every time you use a gear reduction, you're losing at best 10% of the energy because it just it's an efficiency situation. Every gear reduction loses 10% of your power. And that's something we don't often contemplate, think about, and calculate. That's something you should have in your motor calculations. Hopefully advantages to reduce power. I, I think the other thing I would say is this, use mechanical advantage. If you're trying to lift something up, put some springs on it, put some surgical tubing. There is no, re like surgical tubing, it's glorious and wonderful. It is, you know, the low weight and it will, I mean, there's no reason not to have a motor assist by some sort of, you know, lifting device. I think I, hopefully I answered that to that. Why do up and down cables need different speeds? Good question. So the one that we have here, um, if you see the yellow cable, that's the down cable, it's traveling a much larger distance than the red one. So the red one only needs to go this distance. The red one starts, as you see here, the red one starts here, and then the cable only travels like this distance, which is quite short. But if you'll see the yellow cable, the yellow cable has to go all the way up. So the yellow cable has to unspool a large amount of a longer distance than the red one here, which is why I color coded it so that we can make sense of this. So in this situation, you have to have uh, two different sized drums and here it's going to be roughly three times. So the red cable, if it unspools, you know, two inches in a second, the yellow one's going to have to unspool like six, seven inches of, of strap or whatever you're using. That's a good question. It's always hard with these. I, I'm always trying to, I don't want to skip stuff, but I don't want to say things that everybody's already aware of. How does the complicated contiguous lift preserve cable? Good question. Let me go back to the um, complicated contiguous. Conti okay. When I say preserve cable, I guess it's really more that it protects the cable. When you have this insanely com this scares me i'm not even joking um it's cleaner and it protects the cable when you have uh situations like let me go back when you have this this is a continuous rigging and this cable is exposed it's really hard not to have that out there if you're driving around with your robot and you have this part up somebody else could come through with their manipulator and just wham and then your cable's gone or it's tangled up in the other robot and that is that's just scary. I mean, that's that's things that make a coach want to cry. And so teams will um, basically hide their cabling inside the robot. This is much less likely to be snagged by another robot's arm or manipulator or something like that. And so it does protect the cable. That being said, whoo, hoodalali, this is, 
I would heavily recommend doing, like I said before, with the uh, like the force calculations, it's almost impossible to do the calculations, especially when you realize friction. So set this up, hook it up, and pull, and you will be shocked at the massive amount of frictional force that has been added here. Because if you just try to lift this stage with uh, the stage three, the, the traveler, it doesn't, it's not that hard. But all this friction, I mean, like, good night. It's hard to even follow it when I have it this way. So good question. Okay. A lot of, yeah, the lifts are complicated. There's a lot of questions about that. Any questions about the arms? I like a simple arm. It's nice and easy. It's the job done a lot of times. I will say that if you've never built a um, a pivoting, you know, four bar linkage, those I love those. Those can get a lot of stuff done. Um, my trouble is I can't talk my team into doing like a double one, like the one I showed you guys with uh, the arm from. Uh, team team 33 that is that is just mind-blowingly amazing to me yeah that that's impressive that is that's some crazy stuff anybody else have a question how important is lateral stability well the answer to every question is well that depends you know, but I know you're getting sick of that and I, I get it, but it's, it's really a question about um, the game, where you're going to be in the game. Is it, is there a lot of defense in the game? Are you trying, like if this, this robot that's up on screen right now, that was built for power up when there was a lot of um, kind of defense, especially around the giant, the giant teeter totter in the center. And that is some scary stuff. If you are gonna be smacked into by a lot of robots, if there's gonna be a lot of collisions, um, then yeah, then lateral stability is extremely important. If you have a situation where it is um, much less defensive, where you're more likely to be on your side of the field and not smacking into a robot, uh, an alliance, well, sorry, an opponent robot. But that little slip up there actually, many times, many times, it's your own alliance members that smack into you just because in built, you know, we're not the greatest at driving all the times. Uh, we had one, we were helping a robot and they accidentally hit our power switch and our robot was dead in the water and we were trying to get them unhooked. So, but I guess, the, so the question is like, is it going to be smacked into a lot? The more collisions, the more stability you need. And that is really something that is, is really important. Um, is one design better than others? Yes and no. I mean, yeah. I mean, that's, yes. It's so, oh man. Yeah, you're right. It's a good question, but it's always so hard because I mean, there are definitely, there are definitely challenges that um, lend themselves to one design, or I should probably say designs that lend themselves to specific challenges more than others. That being said, it's so hard because um, teams that it's, it's kind of what I talk about in the summary. It's like, if your team's really good at scissor lifts, then you can probably build a better scissor lift than you can a you know parallel arm. But if if your team, it's it's about what your team's abilities are. Um, the other thing you have to realize is speed. If uh, speed can cover a lot of other downsides and cons, you want to be able to pick up the parts as quick as you can, the game piece, and then score as quick as you can. If your elevator takes forever, and this is where we talked about like. Uh, the elevator, if your elevator is going up to score game pieces, then you need it to be fast. If your elevator is going to be used to pull your robot up off the ground and hang, then you need it to be powerful. If you want it to do both, you're in trouble. And there are teams that tried to do that in, like Power Up was a year. Uh, they would use their elevator to go up and down real fast to score game pieces. Then they would use that same elevator to hang. And uh, there was a team that was blowing out motors. The motors were just, you know, Smoky, and their solution was buy a whole bunch of those motors and name the robot Smoky. Now, that's a solution. Um, I don't know if that's a great solution, but that's where you had teams. It was um, 
that was problematic. And that you, you, you can ask your manipulator to do too much. That being said, you always want it to be as multi-purposed as possible. And I know that I just gave you contradictory advice, but that is first robotics. You want your part, yeah. So is there one, uh, yeah, it's so hard. And there have been competitions where I've talked with coaches and they're like, oh, this is a year for an elevator. Yeah, everybody should have an elevator. And then you get to competition, you see somebody with the glorious four bar linkage and they do an amazing job. So it's, there's a, uh, I'll, I'll say this too. There's a, in my PowerPoint one, <laughs> there was advice from a coach. It was um, the Whitfield guy. And he's like, you should never do this. And then a couple of years later, his team built that, right? So, and I've been guilty of that too. Um, I've said, we should never use this. We should never use this. And we should never use this. And one year we had all three on the robot. So, all right. This design on the screen has less than 20%. Good catch. You are totally right. And one would hope, okay, well, I think you're probably right. Oh, it's hard to tell here, but so like this, it does look like the, the top part. But what you see is this second stage here is, it ends right there. So, so this one is, can I, let me do this. All right, annotate. Let me do some drawing here. Okay, so this is the top of the first stage and this is the bottom of the first stage. So what it's doing is it's showing um, so there's actually about like 50% overlap, but it, I totally get it. It looks like, it looks like there's nothing. This one down here, the red, that's the bottom of the second stage. So the base is down here and then the first stage. So it does look like there's less than 20% overlap, but what you see is there's actually about 50% overlap. Our problem is almost always two stages is really, really complicated. It's, it's like exponential. It's not twice as complicated, it's two squared. It's like four times more complicated, which is why we're much, much more likely to do a traveler inside of that first stage. We'll have a base with a stage one and then a traveler inside that base. That was a good question though, a good catch. All right, do we have any other questions? Oh, there it goes. Oh, now that I said all that, let me see. Can I pause it at its height? No, I can't. Okay. Um, I wonder when this one's all the way up, that might be less than 20% when it's all the way up. Sorry, David, I stand corrected. When this thing's all the way up, but also, dang, when you need to do that, Still, this is where I did say that you should have a, bra uh, a ratchet or a brake of some sort. There's a picture I show in the third PowerPoint where a team, they literally just took a bike brake and put it on the robot. You know what, it works. Um, we tried this year, we, the VEX Planetary Gearbox has a, a slice that you can put in with a ratchet. And we tried that, the problem was it wasn't strong enough to hold um, the weight of the robot. Also, there was another issue. So we ended up designing and building our own brake, uh, which we're pretty happy with. Also, the other situation was that we could much more easily, we could much more easily um, release it to get the robot off. Just looking at the rollers. Oh, I see what you're saying. Good call. Yeah, you're right. The other situation is a lot of times when we build the, the rollers, um, the rollers always have to stop short and a little bit. But I think you're right, David. I think this is probably less than 20%. I stand corrected. Hey, Mark, I think we are just about at time. Okay. So maybe we can take a, one last question if anyone has one. There we go. Any last one? All right, we'll make sure and get this presentation up on the Jumpstart website as well as getting um, the video, the recording of this up on Jumpstart. And um, at the end of this one, there's some links to some other things. 
I hope I hope this helped. I hope this gave you some idea or some place to start. This is just kind of the basic general overview. Um, but yeah, thank you for watching. And for those of you who uh, know about this presentation in the past, usually, I'm so sorry for this, usually I throw chocolate out for answers to questions. And so I'm sorry, I did still buy the chocolate